Um, after watching the film, uh, a lot of uh, what I mentioned after the game, I don't remem remember everything that I said, but um, I think our team improved. I think that's the third week in a, in a row that we've improved, and um, man, they're pulling really hard for each other. Um, I love the sideline. I love the, the energy. I think we started very fast. I think we were confident from the beginning of the game um, all the way through, and and I think handled the trip um, all the way up uh, and through the uh, the experience very well. Um, I think uh, the defense uh, took a significant step forward. I saw signs of that in the second half uh, versus Oregon, and I saw a continuation of that. Myself and the defensive staff are becoming much more clear of how much we can do um, and with whom uh, and against what opponents and what that looks like, which is, uh, again, very um, streamlined and simple, but hopefully effective um, offensively. I think that uh, we started very fast, moved the ball very, effect very effectively for the first half in particular, um, and second half stalled, not really due to any adjustments um, that UConn made. Their plan was the same plan, first and second half. We just weren't quite as sharp with our execution um, in the second half. Um, in particular, first downs, um, uh, when, when we're effective on first down, the chains tend to move and we get rhythmical and, and we have more success. When we're not as successful on first down right now, we're not as successful. We'll continue to look um, offensively to use our personnel the best way possible. Um, we've taken steps toward that to where we personnel almost every play, which means certain players in certain positions on certain plays to get the ball. That will continue. Um, we still think we need our intermediate and long-term passing game to improve. Um, we like the ability to have um, shots and chunks at a higher level than what we're currently getting. Um, a good example of that would be on the two-minute drive, just the uh, the first play uh, to Donnie Dowling, um, and then the fourth down play to, to Keon. We have players that are capable of that, and um, I would like to see, and we would like to see more of that mixed throughout the game, rather than just the situations that um, uh, expose or call for that. Um, Special teams-wise, um, our cover units, uh, our punt team has been very strong the entire year. They continue to be. I thought our kickoff coverage unit, just as watching them um, attack and run downfield, I thought that was improved, and that was something that uh, I wanted to see a focus on. Um, not many return opportunities on the punt, um, but Daniel Ham had a, an 11-yard return on one that I thought he did a nice job of. Kick return is probably an area right now that I'd like to see more opportunities and, and a higher level of execution. But the kickers we faced, um, they're, they're putting the ball in the end zone. Um, so uh, with that, I think as a general summary, I'll take questions now in terms of specifics and things you'd like to know. For you as a head coach, this is uncharted territory, yeah. being 0-3. Has this shaken your faith in your <laughs> principles at all? And No, it, it hasn't, uh, but it's not easy. Uh, I was sharing, uh, I just left the defensive meeting room and Coach Ruff and I were, were talking and this is a first. Uh, I haven't been 0-3 before. Um, but it, it's interesting, it doesn't feel like that to me now. Um, I'm focusing so much on what I see as growth and improvement and and I'm completely engrossed in in the task. It's, this is a massive change effort, it really is, at, at every turn. And I want these kids, number one, I, I've grown so close to them already, at least from my perspective, and I really want them to have success. And there's a lot to work on still. Um, but yeah, I'm not used to it, uh, but motivated by it. And I, I'm trying to um, use that command influence, so to speak, uh, to help the players learn and channel that difficult things mean um, that you work effectively, you analyze, um, you reframe, and then you go again. And I'm doing my best to ensure that they're able to learn those lessons, but does not make it any easier for someone that's more mature and had more experience. It's still difficult. Um, but uh, I came here to, to do hard things, and this is hard. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing it through to the kind of success I believe we can have. Obviously, when you got here in uh, in January, you <coughs> evaluated every position on the roster. Can you walk us through how the kicker situation sure. came to be? You had a mid-year enroll. You had Andrew King. They aren't here anymore. How did this come to be where uh, you had to bring in a guy kind of, as Zach Bradshaw said, kind of off the street in August? Yeah, um, I think you addressed uh, or hit on it pretty quickly. 
Um, we had a, a signee at mid-year, and we had an existing player in the program. Um, uh, one player, the, the mid-year signee, and uh, one player was is no longer with the team, and that happened earlier um, in our off-season cycle, and then. Um, our other player that was with our team um, was uh, um, removed from the program for violation of team rules as well, and, as well as a long snapper becoming academically ineligible. So our snapper and, and both place kickers that were here. And then um, Dylan Sims, our, the, the kicker that we had been using, had a groin injury all, all week, took no kicks uh, in terms of PAT field goal nor kickoffs. And so we used him for the kickoff. Um, but had no PAT and field goal work. Uh, Furbank handled every snap and every kick all week long, and, and really the team was completely behind him, and he did a really good job uh, in kicking a field goal and an extra point and um, uh, difficult situations on the last one, uh, a brand new one and a lot of pressure. But he had a great week, and he earned the chance to, to be our kicker for that week. He'll stay there and compete for it. Um, and so if Dylan becomes healthy with his groin and can practice, then we'll see who uh, and how that plays out and who's the most accurate um, week by week. If Dylan isn't able to practice, then Furbank will get all the reps and, and remain in that spot. Has Andrew King been permanently separate from the team, or is he <clears throat> just under suspension? Uh, just, uh, just under suspension at this point. <clears throat> Bronco, I know you didn't spend a lot of time looking at the accolades and stuff of the guys that were here when you got here, but right. when Andrew Brown got here, he came in with Quinn, two five-star guys. Everyone mm -hmm. thought he was going to set the world on fire, and to a lot of people, Saturday was the first time he really kind of showed what he can be. What, what's his development been like since you got here, and, and what are your impressions of him? Um, he, he's gone from a player that has had very little experience um, to a player that's emerging um, within his assignments, within his technique, and understanding um, not only our system, but situational football. That is a work in progress. He's capable. He's quick. He's fast. Um, and he's, um, we, we have a saying um, in our program of less drama, more work. And Andrew's threshold, like a lot of young players, is, is um, um, becoming heightened, which means what, what it takes to rattle a younger player is normally here, but with seasoning it becomes higher. And Andrew is becoming uh, much more mature as a football player and as a person. And he's handled his role very well. Um, and he'll be the first to tell you there are a player, there is a player two per game that he might go the wrong direction or, or um, be a little bit wild. But man, the number of plays he's putting together consistently with production, by the way, that's, that's what people are starting to see. I think everyone saw the potential of and maybe a flash here or there, and I don't think he played much. Um, but I think he's very, very capable. And much like the other seven or eight players out there defensively that are getting a lot of um, um, experience, he's growing consistently. The, one of the differences with Andrew, though, is he just has the size and speed and playmaking ability to when he does do it, when he does his job correctly, um, and or he's at the point of attack, he really stands out as a playmaker. And part of uh, what we're uncovering about our team is not only um, who will try hard and whose assignments sound, but who is capable of making a play. And then where do we put them? How do we leverage them? How do we design the calls to help um, our best players be at the point of attack? Um, most frequently. That's offense and defensively, defensively. And what we thought in week one became different in week two. Now that we've seen week three, that's different. So quite a few changes still being made in trying to help uh, this current group of players um, be in the positions where they uh, fit best. Rocco, and when we were talking to Andrew, he mentioned that you're a man of numbers. And yeah. in showing or in explaining to the team they've improved from week one to week two to week three, you show them numbers from not only this year but BYU. What, what kind of things are you showing them, and, and how does that help them? Uh, just, just simple metrics. Um, when uh, I, I love research and I love numbers, and, and um, I'm a holistic thinker, but um, under pressure, I go right to the numbers to, to validate and, and to clarify the picture. And so we, we have a really clear idea. Of, of how many yards per rush that will lead to success, how many yards per pass, um, per attempt, um, what, um, what a turnover margin needs to look like, how many points we can allow, what field position looks like. And with data of 
uh, now about 13 years worth that says this equals that. And it equals that. I'm not really interested in any statistic that's not over 85% um, because uh, what, I, what I frame everything off of to be an exceptional football program, that's 10 wins or, or more per year. And so we know exactly what statistics and how they lead to certain numbers. And so I'm able to sh share that with the players. And, and they're able to see where they're making ground up, where they still have significant improvement to go. And it, take, it puts a lot of objectivity into it, not subjectivity, um, because certainly I can tell the team they improved. But I like to see where. And I like to have the numbers that substantiate that. And not only helps me design practice and help me figure out which players play where and how, how frequently, but it also gives me metrics that are tangible um, um, and reliable. Um, one of the elements of throwing downfield is protection. Um, how has that influenced your decision making there and maybe your su yeah. success or lack of it? So uh, I think that's a fair question. Um, against Oregon, we had six sacks, um, which discouraged um, my, um, com uh, my comfort level on throwing intermediate to downfield. Um, because negative plays, especially when you're continuing to learn and grow as a team, are hard to overcome. As well as when we have a good quarterback, it's, uh, man, you don't want him to get hit. And we have a lot of season to play. and. So um, it has weighed in. Um, what I will say is this: in this game, and UConn did not bring much pressure. They did bring some, but our protection was substantially better. Um, we did not turn the ball over, and we took it away twice. Um, part of not turning it over was because of our protection and, and because of um, what we've done, not only how long we're holding the ball, but where we're throwing it. And so the protection has to continue to grow. and and develop so we can, and at the same time, for the routes and the concepts intermediate to long develop. And that has Those are working components that go uh, together. And, um, and I, I think that has to happen for us to have uh, another significant breakthrough offensively. Mark, I don't see Tim Harris didn't play on Saturday. He's not on the depth chart here. What is his status? Um, so uh, I'll address the, uh, the injury uh, question more specifically when we get into conference play. Um, and I think that's just what I'll leave that as right now. It seems uh, in the off season that there have been more stories written about time management than mm. I can ever remember, game and time management. Mm. You go, you get the ball 133 left and do a good job with the time management down the field. How do, how do you work those decisions yeah. toward the end of the game like that? We, um, it, it was, uh, there, there really was a low level of anxiety. I'm talking from a coaching staff perspective. Certainly, that's. Um, I think our players were prepared well, but we we were going first to win. Uh, we knew we had no timeouts, um, and we wanted to get a significant chunk somewhere early in the first couple of plays. Um, that usually puts the defense on their heels. It takes a significant amount of pressure off of us because now you have more time for less distance. So we knew, we knew we needed at least one significant play, which we got right off the bat. And then it allowed us to, to make a decision um, toward the end. Again, we were going for the win first. And so I want to make it clear that the, the running play that we, that we designed, um, I think, was a great play. And we had two of our very best blockers, one on one, where defenders had to beat blocks and make the tackle on our quarterback. So we had Albert Reed and Jackson Mateo um, and their, their guys did a nice job, but the defense was extended and spread to play coverage, which is exactly what we wanted. And we had quarterback lead draw um, with the numbers that we wanted. And so in that one case, uh, I thought it was a great call. It didn't work out. But we also had um, the, again, what, what we call Toro, but our hurry up field goal. That was discussed about from, um, man, as soon as the change of possession happened, we knew we were going for the win, but Tor will be ready. And so that was reiterated the entire way down the field. And and um, even then, there could be a player or two that gets lost in the moment. But from, from our perspective, um, it gave us a great chance to at least tie the game. But we were going for the win first. I know he did. Uh, but Coach and I, as you'll, as you'll know, uh, leaders, they take the blame when things don't go well. And, um, and, and don't go as expected. Um, if you don't run the football, if you throw it, there's a little more time. Um, but uh, having had that play score on us in fall camp, uh, I, I endorsed the play. And, um, 
it gave us a chance to tie it because it did score on us <laughs> as a defense because I wasn't expecting it. I was expecting to cover. And um, certainly we can all question it now, but um, having, again, had it score against us, um, I liked the call and I thought it was innovative. And any time a play caller calls something or goes for two and it doesn't work, that's just part of the thing. And, and Robert is not someone that's going to shy away from second guess or uh, taking the, the blame for that. Um, and yeah. Bronco, you uh, you mentioned in your opening statements about how there was kind of maybe a drop off in execution offensively. Mm. Uh, I think the way Coach and I put it after the game was that guys on this team just aren't accustomed to playing for four quarters. Mm. How how do you kind of deal with that? How do yeah. you combat that? We we started in the off season with just um, the the physical conditioning, but there's a difference between physical conditioning and mental conditioning, and there's a difference between mental conditioning and confidence. Um, so being physically conditioned to play four quarters is one thing, which we are. Um, being mentally conditioned to play assignment football for four quarters uh, is something different, and we're growing into that. Um, we're not there yet. Having the confidence and belief to, um, to know the outcome, um, that is another level in the hierarchy. And uh, I think I, I was uh, accustomed and, and ready for the win. And 133 was a plenty of time. Um, uh, but this is a football program that hasn't come behind from much and hasn't won on the road much as I'm learning. And um, confidence really and true confidence only comes from doing. And so we're still building on the simple successes. Critical plays made by um, Donnie and Keon, uh, which are great. And then finishing is something that uh, we need more work on. And I would like to expedite that process as soon as possible. That's why all the um, situational work happened, more than we've ever done in any program I've coached or team I've worked with. Um, and it got us close. Uh, it's still work to do. Uh, Mark Hall seems to have found a niche mm. or a role. Uh, what's his trajectory been? And was he dealing with anything coming out of the spring? Yeah, um, out of the spring, uh, Mark ha hadn't and he didn't make his tempo runs for the majority of the spring, so we didn't see him much. And then as Stephen Wright and Eli Hanback and Jack Powers um, and others um, had been diligent, consistent, um, Mark was be fighting hard just to have any role. And then somewhere along the line in fall camp, because we, installed, we had no nickel plays or nickel defense installed in, in spring practice, but as we installed that starting from fall camp, um, Mark started to show flashes of um, being capable and quick and, and um, have a niche for getting after the quarterback. And so as time has gone on and as, and as we've seen what Dante, um, what his work capacity can be and how to keep him most effective in, um, in our base defense and early downs, we found a, a volume of plays that might have been too much for Dante. And we're thinking, well, who else? Uh, might be able to play a role. And that's when um, not only Mark Hall, um, but Stephen Moy, a true freshman, they both started to find a niche. And really, they, they did a nice job um, in a game that had a lot of nickel in it. Um, those two players, especially Mark, he showed a flash against Oregon on a screenplay. But he, he was a player just this morning we were talking about. And, and we used a very similar role. Looks like he's found a niche. And he'll help our team if he continues to, to work in that regard. You don't strike me as somebody who believes in jinxes or in, <laughs> or in jinxes, jinxing himself. But two weeks ago, you came in here and you said it was maybe the first time one of your teams had not been penalized. Now yeah. you've had back-to-back -back <laughs> pen penalty games. What did you think about the penalties the other day, particularly the interference calls on Thornhill? Um, man, I, I, I'm not sure what the ACC rules are regarding if I can comment or not. No. Um, <laughs> So I guess I can't. Um, what about the fact you were 10 penalties? Yeah, uh, so, so uh, I'm, I'm certainly responsible um, because the team in the opener I thought was soft and non-competitive um, in terms of mindset. And I worked really hard and have worked really hard to make sure they're very competitive and very aggressive. And, and certainly those penalties would be a direct reflection of how I've coached them. And so uh, most likely time now to 
encourage uh, the type of penalties, whether it's a selfish penalty or it's a, a penalty of aggression going to make a play. What I will say is the majority of penalties I saw in that game, um, they were very aggressive and within the context of how they've been coached. There were a few, I can think of two, um, that I was not happy with. Bronco, when uh, Kurt was named starter, you and, and Coach and I talked about the depth of that quarterback position, how much you liked it. When Kurt was getting that shoulder looked at on Saturday, Connor Brewer warmed yeah. up. What is your kind of your, your backup quarterback situation? Um, Con Connor was the backup um, for that particular game and has earned that role. And we have a lot of confidence. And he was, I, I really, after I saw Kurt, I wasn't, and I didn't think he'd go back in. He, I mean, it, I was, I could tell he was in pain. Um, and so it was the next man up, and Kurt was ready to go. Um, the team would have rallied behind him, and and um, and I think everyone will see he's a really good decision maker and has been has earn, earned that role at home, at least going into that game. Bronco, there was almost a joy after the Oregon game hmm. when you saw things that you wanted to see that you hadn't seen against Richmond, and the players came in and they talked about how fun it was. Um, obviously, the game Saturday kind of has a different, totally hmm. different ending and kind of a bitter feel. How's the team been since, and, and do you sense that that same that – it seems like a, a pressure cooker, like when you guys win, it's going to just blow. I, I, uh, I have that feeling. I don't know the timing. I, I really don't. But what, what I can tell you what I told the team without being too intimate, I, I enjoy coaching this team the past two weeks. They, and they want to win, and they're, they're doing um, – they're eating up whatever we throw at them that um, we tell them will help, and, and it is helping. And um, I just, uh, uh, I, w I was emotional and am emotional um, because I can see how hard they're working and I can see how close they're getting. And, and I would love for that breakthrough to happen as much or more than anyone. Um, but I also know there's still a significant way we have to go. <laughs> and um, we have to earn those victories. Um, no one's gonna give us a thing. And I'm in uncharted charted territory as the coach, um, having uh, an 0-3 start. But they're uncharted um, in terms of maybe um, being praised and, and, and uh, complimented for things that um, are maybe hidden to, to others. And uh, my primary focus is to help these kids develop as football players and people. And I gave them till tomorrow morning, because <laughs> that's about what it's going to take me. Um, to to come back ready to go, and they will. Um, but um, that was harder because we saw even more improvement. I think from week one to week two, I thought I think we took even a bigger step week two to week three, and and now could taste it, see it, touch it, almost smell what what that would look like, and um, and we just realized we're not there yet, and it's not an accident. We're just not there yet, and my job is to help our team get there, and. I, um, I really want that to happen sooner rather than later. But, but again, I'll reemphasize a lot of work still to do. Um, Central Michigan has a veteran quarterback who's putting up great numbers without turning the ball over much. What challenge in particular does Cooper Rush present? Just, just what you said. Um, when, when you face experience, um, um, as we have a number of times this year, uh, UConn was another experienced team. That doesn't mean dynamic or explosive or great, but it does mean um, mature. And that in college football is leads to consistency, which a lot of times leads to winning. And I think that um, what Central Michigan has is that. And there's a few positions that really influence the team and have an impact at a higher level than most, and they happen to have experience and a quality player at one of those positions with a very good staff, a very good scheme, and, and a history of success. So um, uh, again, I, I, know, I know now enough about Central Michigan as to what they are. And that really is intriguing until um, I go right back to now, who are we and what do we need to do? And so again, you, you, might, get, uh, you might tire in hearing this, but <laughs> as soon as I've seen them, the focus went completely back. And it still is only on us. We have so much work to do to have that um, significant step forward that uh, it's just now what scheme and who are we doing it against. But we're, we still have, uh, uh, and I think for a long time, it'll just be on how we improve um, our program. Kind of off of that, mm. 
not mentioning Central Michigan specifically, but you know they are averaging over 40 points a game. Your defense is coming off of a really good game. What's the next step? You know, for your defense to yeah. keep, make it consistent back to back weeks. Um, so I, I think it's been a consistent game and a half. Um, so the the second half against Oregon, um, I saw signs of consistency coming, and then there'd still be a, a breakdown here or there. But I see a momentum, and so the next step simply is against um, a very good offense, which our opponent is, to have a consistency in terms of uh, point production and and. Um, uh, execution that it doesn't seem as uh, as up and down, and the the Connecticut UConn game was was very steady um, for the most part of that game in terms of defensive performance, and so it's now we'll know where we stand is if we can start putting a string together of not only quarter by quarter but half by half and then game by game, and when that happens, uh, then we could say there's been another step forward and that's that's what I think was the answer to your question is is sustaining it I suspect that having Sunday as your day off is a personal decision yeah. you've seen it done both ways by coaches here are there advantages to sure. like have having a day to clear your head and sure. are you able to put it out of your mind at all on Sundays that there, there are advantages uh, both ways. Um, for those that choose not to take Sunday off, um, clearly just the volume of work you can put in. And so a typical day for, for coaches that don't take Sunday off, um, they will um, do all of the film work with their players uh, that we do today. That means they put the, the UConn game to bed. Um, a lot of times they get a lift in and a workout with their players, and then they introduce their, their new opponent. So that happens all on Sunday. And then Monday would be the players' day off, but the coaches are still working. Uh, I, I work hard to teach um, young people uh, balance and perspective. And college football is difficult for even someone that's 50 um, for the value of a win and a loss. Uh, you've seen grown men do things and act ways that they normally don't when they win. <laughs> and and a high step and celebrate and cheer and it's an elaborate or it's an emotional and it's an exhilarating feeling uh, on the other side uh, it can it can lead you to a place mentally that's pretty dark and uh, not very fun and it can it can help you it can help you um, lose sight of what's really important and I would love to say that I I'm still working on being the same person with my wife and my kids with a win or a loss but by not working Sunday uh, what helps is I, have, I watch the game immediately after we play it. Once I see it, I know what to do. And then I can have Sunday to, um, to reframe and to recharge and hopefully be the best version of myself for my team and my family going forward. And, and I'm usually over it um, by the time I show up at work uh, Monday morning and our meetings start at 545 on Monday morning. And, um, and we work. We do all of what teams normally do on Sunday. We do that Monday. And then it's a fast, fast turnaround. And our longest work day of the week is Monday, um, sometimes till midnight um, on Monday with an early morning practice. But that Sunday to be with family and for many of us to focus on a day of rest and our faith is something we think is essential. And so I'm going back to my original point. I'm trying to teach the players balance. and. And they are not defined only by being a football player. And I see so many of these kids struggle when they leave the NFL because they've always been defined only by being a football player. I'd like them to discover who they are in addition to that. And um, I work, and we work as a staff to design it that way. And so hopefully somewhere in there answered your question. Um, it, it's essential for me personally, I'll just put it this way, to have that day to to meet the rigors of this um, profession and to have any kind of um, sustainability. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to keep going, um, certainly not for 11 years and, and hopefully for um, a long tenure here to lead to success. I wouldn't be able to do that without that. And so I knew that enough about myself um, and then I've tried to branch that out and teach others. By the way, uh, one side note on that that I, got, I have to say. Um, after our first game against um, Richmond and we didn't play well and, and, and everyone saw that, um, Coach Ruff showed up at the office on Sunday because <laughs> he didn't believe it. He thought it was the BYU staff was just tricking him. And, and um, 
So he, sh I think he showed up. You'll have to ask him. I think he showed up twice. Uh, he, he, he disclosed that on Monday where he goes, I mean, you, and he went back and, and told Ar Erlene, his wife, they're really not there. And uh, that was like, you know, he, he couldn't grasp how that worked. Um, and uh, it is real. Um, and and my, my staff has been called liars when they tell, uh, like, coaches at the convention that we, we don't work on Sunday. And, and they'd say, man, we've never known you to not tell us the truth. And, and so it's hard to believe because it makes it, it – but if, if the work model's in place, um, I think it can work. And, and uh, um, I want it to work. And I want it to work not only where I've been, but I want it to work here. Or Central Michigan beat Oklahoma State a couple weeks yeah. ago with a crazy ending. You opened last year what seemed like every game winning that way, whether it was Nebraska yeah. or Boise or whatever. What can that do for a team? And then contrasting, what can your loss, a uh, heartbreaking loss, do for a team both ways? Uh, I think there's lessons to be learned either way. Um, identities are fragile uh, of teams and of programs. And especially this early, uh, I'm going to give you a philosophical stance first, and this will help frame it. I don't think the polls should come out until after week eight, because um, I don't think anyone knows how good anyone is, and nor what comparative victories and all that. Um, I think it drives TV ratings really well. And I think as soon as you put numbers by someone's name, viewership goes up and attendance goes up, and there becomes more intrigue than if there are no numbers by the side of a team. Um, and I voted on the USA Today panel for, I oh mean, three or four years in a row. But that would be my suggestion. And so, but it can influence who you think you are. And, and so that does happen. And so a year ago, after a couple close wins, we thought we'd earned the wins. And we thought, man, this, we have a fantastic team. And if you don't have um, a coaching staff that's looking behind the numbers to verify that, you can set yourself up for a giant fall. If you do have a staff that's looking for that, you can be realistic with your team and saying, man, um, amazing win. Now let's take a look at what this really shows. And the same thing can happen for losses. And, um, and so I think the best way to, to frame either one of those is that the head coach and the leadership has to have the perspective that is real in relation to the current situation. It doesn't take any luster off the wins. And it doesn't take any sting off the losses. Um, but the perspective is what has to be in place to carry on. And I think that's what a leader's job is to do, is to make sure that perspective is in place based on real data that will um, uh, help the team continue to improve. Hey, Bronco, kind of following up on your Sunday theory about need in that day and all that stuff, and you being in uncharted territory, how does what you're going through now and, and, and all that affect your how you spend your non-negotiable 90 minutes a day? Oh, man. That, that's a great question. It's been tempting to cut into it um, because of the vol volume of work to do. But I, I go into sustainability again. And um, man, I, I believe if I don't have that, um, I won't be at my best and I won't enjoy what I'm doing. And, and uh, I get to do something I, I really like to do. Doesn't mean it's easy. And I think the only way I can do that at my best to give our team the best chance is to, to maintain that. And, um, and I don't think my mental or physical health um, is something that I, uh, I'm willing to trade. Uh, I want to be the coach and the person that, that again, does and. That um, you can have a great football program. You can be a great husband. You can be a great father. You can be a great friend. And, 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 and. That's what I would like to do. And I don't think you can do and unless you're putting um, energy into the tank. Um, and I've chosen an appropriate amount of time with staff members that um, are very capable. And I think we work very well together. And at some point, I don't know when, it'd be fun to say, man, I'm glad I've stuck. we stuck with it because now you can see what it looks like. Um, and certainly every right to question now um, of what, what it is. Um, but I don't intend to change it, even even though um, the the human side of me is is wants to give every minute of every hour to these t these team members. Um, but what what do I give them when I get home? <laughs> and uh, and that's not a trade I'm willing to make. And I don't think it's a trade. Again, I think it's and. I want to do it all, and I'm hoping to prove that I can. Do you ever get strange looks from like bait shop owners? <laughs> 
<laughs> haven't been to a bait shop yet, and, and really the, my renewal time to this point has been uh, uh, running and lifting. Uh, I ride my bike on the Ravana Trail. Uh, it's a nice little single track back there where it feels like you're in Colombia or Nicaragua or something on a mountain bike. Um, and that's uh, an hour and a half is just doing that is I'm ready to work when I come back. And I work really fast, really hard, really effective with kind of hard charging coaches that are doing the same. We do think there's a principle that work expands to the boundaries you set. I've been on the staffs where the head coach won't leave, which means the assistants won't leave. And they just space out their work, the same amount of work, because they know how much time they have. Well, what if you don't have that much time but the same amount of work? We work frantically when we're at work. And um, I'm anxious for the fans, this community, and these kids to, to see the benefit of a quality program consistently in winning. Um, but I'm also not going to sugarcoat the brutal facts of we have a long ways to work and there's a culture existing that has not been successful. And um, I would love to say it can turn overnight. It's not going to turn overnight. It's longer and harder than what I thought, um, but it is still correctable. And I, I'm sure of that. Um, and I'm willing to work hard to make that happen.